And I know we project all of this stuff and that we don't use a lot of paper sometimes, but I'd love you to take this one out if you, if you wouldn't mind because really I've got nothing on your outline. I'd love you to, I'd love you to write down some things about tough road trips because that's what this is about today. This is about a tough road trip. And, you know, so I went on the Internet to find the world's worst road trips. So I've got a few examples for you. World's worst road trips. So the first one I found was, it was the very one at the top of the list. It's a guy who, who doesn't like dogs, do animals, and he, and he took his girlfriend's dog to her cross country, to where she had moved to. And when he got there, in, all the way across the country in a car, and then when he got there, she dumped him. World's worst road trip. Second one, how about this one? This, this student talked about their teacher who was a huge, you know, tree hugger, you know, animal rights activist, you know, that kind of thing. Took them to a wildlife refuge and ran over a squirrel. She cried incessantly for four more days. World's worst road trip. Here's another one. <laughs> this one, actually, this almost happened to my father-in-law. When this was their worst road trip, they're driving down the interstate and the camper they were pulling passed them in the left lane. <laughs> Here's another one. So this, have you ever been like on a choir tour or, or like gone on a, on a team trip, like eight hour drive to a state tournament or something? If one kid gave the bus driver a song to play, he thought he meant to for them to repeat it. So they heard Love Shack 92 times. Or how about this one? An 18-month-old baby screamed incessantly. The only thing that would stop them is the three-day cross-country trip was polka music. <laughs> Could you imagine three days of that? Oh, my gosh. Here's my story. So when I got married, so I was heading to seminary out of college. That was the plan. And I uh, waited a year for Teresa at work. She worked. We saved our money. Didn't have gobs of money, but we saved enough money. So we got married in Coeur d'Alene. We were going to drive to St. Louis, move where the seminary was, and then drop off our stuff in our apartment that my uncle had reserved for us and then drive on to New York for honeymoon. New York City is for honeymoon. She would see where I grew up and all that stuff. That was the plan. We loaded everything up. Are any of you old enough to remember the, the company Jartran? They used to rent trailers like U-Haul and stuff. Anyway, Jartran. And they used to also rent um, bolt-on hitches onto your bumper. Well, we did that. And about 50 miles into the trip, our bumper came off. I was, was almost right watching the trailer go by you as you're going down there. But anyway, it fell off. Boom, there we are. Just safety chains dragging the thing all over the place. So there we are at the side of the road. I had to call my father-in-law to rescue me. And so he came. We had to stay. We had to spend all this extra money shipping our stuff. We had to fix the car. All of the stuff. Had, we didn't have any money for honeymoon. So we finally get to St. Louis where it's 98 degrees and 105% humidity. And we move into our lovely one-bedroom apartment in which you could wipe the nicotine off the walls and the cockroaches spread, you know, when you turn on the light. As I, as I was mad at my uncle, the missionary from New Guinea, I should have remembered that. He thought it was awesome. Anyway, I moved my new wife into this one-bedroom apartment, and that evening a gunman shows up at our front door. And uh, so that was our road trip, worst road trip ever. Worst road trip ever. And I bet you that you have some stories like that, too, uh, different ones like that. Um, might, maybe not exactly like that that ends with a gunman, you know. I mean, but you probably have stories of, you know, flat tires and losing money and transmissions failing and kids whining. Any of those? Any kid whining stories, right? Um, yeah, just a few. So if you go down here, I want you these five things. On that sheet, there's five blanks. And th out of this story that we heard the Let's Rings do for us with this wandering around in the wilderness, here's five common things that I think we can relate to about tough road trips. What causes those challenges on a journey? Here's the first one. I've never been there before. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to go through these real quick, Luis. I've never been there before. Second one is, and you, anyway, let me, I'll explain it a little bit as we go along. So you'll have to go back to one. Sorry, you have to go back to one. So I've never been there before. You know how this is, isn't it? Like, I remember the first time Teresa and I took the kids to Disneyland, I about had an ulcer. 
you know, trying to navigate. I mean, I didn't think, I didn't plan it out right. This is before the Internet and before, you know, smartphones and GPS things and all of that. And so, you know, you're trying to navigate L.A. traffic, and I'm kicking myself because we're there during rush hour, and I'm, I'm just not smart, and we drove through the night, and the kids are little, and I, and I didn't think, you know, my son was really too little to enjoy most of the rides. And blah, 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 you know, there's all of this stuff that happens. And so that first trip down to Disneyland was probably not the best one. You're anxious, you're tense, especially if you're kind of in charge. You know, the oblivious people in the back seat, that's no problem. But if you're kind of in charge, it's a tough road trip because you don't know exactly where you're going, haven't been there before, not sure, you know, all of that. But boy, isn't it great the second or third time or fourth time you go do the thing? Now I'm like, now I can give people counsel on what to do at Disneyland, right? Here's what you do. Here's where you stay. Here's when you get your reservation. Here's how it goes. And many of you could do the same. But, you know, it's once you go. But the first time you go, I don't know where I'm going. That's a tough one on the journey. Second one, second one, the meal never changes, right? Isn't that what they say? Oh, I hate this manna. This manna just stinks. This is horrible stuff. To be honest, the way they describe it in the Bible, it sounds like baklava to me. Sounds pretty good. I mean, it's hunter, honey, little coriander seed. And it's kind of, uh, it sounds pretty, I mean, I get it, right? Year after year of this stuff. Okay, I get it. But the meal never changes. It's the same old, same old, right? You ever get that? I mean, if you have kids or picky eater kids, you know this story, right? Really, honey, do we have to go to Taco Bell again? Really? I mean, can we have real food somewhere? You know, or does it have to be pizza again or macaroni and cheese or whatever, right? It's just the same old stuff that's the other complaint third one the third one is we're scared and that's fair if you notice he even here in town we've had a couple of accidents here recently remember when both sides of the freeway were closed with the b man i had to remember to roll my window up as i drove over there and i think i'll bet you you guys had a finney's i bet you you had them in your backyard didn't I mean, it was, and, you know, I can just imagine, only imagine, because a month or so ago or more, we had a trailer that crossed the freeway and stopped all the traffic. And, you know, if you've had a tire blow out, if I've had that happen with my father, it was frightening. So sometimes on the journey, frightening things happen. Sometimes you're in a sketchy part of town, you got a hotel reservation, and you said, I've said this recently on Priceline, that was not a three-star hotel. I'm just telling you, okay, that was not. And so sometimes that happens to you, and you are you might be in a part of town or in a situation or mechanically something happens or financially something happens. You know, I've been on a trip where all my credit cards have been denied, and I, now I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know how to correct it. I don't know how to do it, and so that was tough. So there are times when you're actually kind of frightened at certain moments, and I want to be honest about that. that. That's not just being facetious. The fourth one is we're lost. We're lost. And maybe you, you know, maybe all of you guys out there have a perfect sense of direction. God bless you. I don't. And there have been times where we've made a wrong turn. And sometimes it's, it's um, almost hopelessly lost. And now this is different in this day and age, but I'll tell you my story. We go to see Sarah on last week, Wednesday. That's why we're gone Sunday. We're worshiping with her in a gymnasium uh, at their high school at the Mission Church. It was pretty cool. And uh, they were really trying to reach out into their community. But uh, she teaches at a high school there. And uh, so we were with her. But the first two days of our trip, we went to visit a uh, high school. Uh, there are three Lutheran high schools. We went to visit them. But that evening, we get in. Our plane is two hours late. So the flight's delayed. It is pouring rain in Omaha. It is pitch black. And we have T-Mobile. They don't have T-Mobile. I mean, they do. But they don't have T-Mobile. <laughs> So I'm sitting in the airport, we're both desperately trying to get a signal so we can find our way to meet our daughter. And, and it was, we were lost. And you know, you're sitting there in the rain and the dark and not knowing where you're going. That's a tough thing when you make a wrong turn. And the last one is this, if your kids don't stop, I'm kicking you out. <laughs> okay, if you guys don't knock it off. I look at you guys, it cranks me up, you got five. So at any given time, somebody's being a pill, right? You got five. <laughs> um, 
So what, what's the response, though? Would you, wouldn't you say those are fair? That's what the Israelites are saying. You know, we haven't been there before. We're frightened. Um, we're, we have, we're anxious about it. We don't know the way, right? You even hear it from Jesus' disciples. We don't know the way. Um, the meal never changes, right? It's just over and over the same old thing. We get those complaints. We're, we're scared. We're lost. And if you guys don't knock it off in the back seat, I'm kicking you out by the side of the road. I think those are all fair. Those are from the story, and I think those are all things that we can relate to. But what is God's response to these things? And so let's, I want to look at that with you for a minute. So I'm going to jump back to number one. Uh, Louise, thank you. So I've never been there before. And this may sound trite, but this is the answer. When we go to places spiritually, when we're in our journey, and we go, I haven't been there before. You know, here's the thing. You may be going through a time of healing with a loved one. Maybe you've gone through a really tough diagnosis, surgery. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've never been unemployed. Maybe you were asked to early retire, or maybe you were asked to relocate. Maybe you've been in a very difficult spot. You've always uh, been in a marriage, and the marriage is dissolved or something. I don't know what it is. Maybe you've always had kids around, and now you're an empty nester. I haven't been there before. This, I, I hate that this sounds trite, but this is the truth. God is saying to you, you haven't been there, but I have. I've been there. I stand there. I am there. And so when you come to this place, I will be there. I love that verse in John where Jesus says to his disciples, I know you're worried. I get it. But don't you know that if I said that I'm going to prepare a place for you, don't you know I'll come and I'm going to come get you to bring you to be where I am. Don't you know I love you that much? And so this is the first thing that I think God is saying to the Israelites. Why are you belly aching so much? And why are you so fearful about this? I'm already there. If even if you may be on a journey and on a stage of your journey where you don't know where that's going, God is pleading with you to say, I am there. And that's one of the great blessings of God giving his name to Moses and to the people. And what a unique name it was. This is one of the promises of the name of God. I am with you. It's why the name of Jesus foretold. Emmanuel, God is with us. I am with you. So even if you may never have been there before, I am there. Do you know this? When you have someone who's been to a place before, don't you relax completely? Or maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you're that much of a control freak. But if I know someone who's been there many times, man, I can just sit in the back and I can be in the bus. I can be and we're chatting and we're visiting and it's all good to go. And what a blessing that is on this one. I think God is asking the question, how much do you trust your leader? Do you trust me in where I'm going? Because I've already stood there. That's a blessing. That's not meant to condemn you. Or condemn me. That's meant to give you hope. He's already there. Okay, second one. The meal never changes. And, and uh, isn't that a first world complaint, these guys? You know, they're in the middle of nowhere. They're in the middle of the desert. And God provides spring water, right? Artesian well. He has spring water. And he's got quail. I mean, this is like baklava and pheasant. All right? He's got, it's this manna with honey and coriander, and you've got this, uh, this wonderful quail, right? And it comes in and feeds them over and over and over. It really is in some ways almost a first world complaint. And here's my point. This was, my f- this was the favorite thing that I wanted to share with you out of this sermon today. The meal never changes. And I want to tell you this, folks, here in this place, the meal never changes. The meal never changes. Thank God the meal never changes. Because when you come to this place, you're going to get this. You're going to get, and you know I've told you this before, right? We are the most boring people in the world because we preach the same sermons every week. Okay, here's how you blew it. Here's how God forgives you. Here's how we respond with grace, with, with gratitude. Same sermon every week. Here's this week. Here's how we blew it. We bellyache and complain. 
Here's how God fixes it. He hangs in there with us, undeserved, unearned. And now how do we live in gratitude to take away that burden? That's the story. That's it. I probably should have stopped earlier, right? But my point is, thank God the meal never changes. Whether it's being fed by the word of God and his promise and grace, or whether it's kneeling at this altar and receiving in Christ's body and blood, that meal never changes. It never changes. God forbid we should get cute with this and say, oh, let's have donuts and coffee for communion. That's not the meal. That's not the meal. This is the meal. Or if somebody says, you know what, why don't you, Pastor, you should change the word. You don't have to preach out of that. Why don't you give us five steps for being better parents? Or why don't you give us five steps for being uh, better, better kids or spouses or whatever? I'm sorry, it's not the meal. This is the meal. And thank God, because you will know what you get every time is life-giving and has the promise of God, and it will do what God intends. So in that sense, we say, thank you, we, the meal never changes. Third thing, we're scared. So I, I often think when we think of uh, times when we're scared in a trip, and I have seen people say, I'm not going to take that trip, I'm too scared. You know, I can't, you know, like I go and build houses in Mexico, I love to do that. And there is some rightful anxiousness for people to say, I don't know if I want to go to Mexico, right? I read the news. Or if somebody says, we're going to take a trip to the Holy Land, and some people say, I don't know if I'm going to do that. I've heard that. I get it. There is some fear that paralyzes us. There is some fear that stops us. But here's the way I look at it. So, for instance, there are times when days go by, day after day, where I have trouble sleeping because of all that dirt moving out there. I mean, I'm honestly, I mean, there are times I see it and I go, I wake up in the middle of the night and I go, Lord, what have we done? Not because I think it's wrong, but because I'm inadequate to the task. I am not adequate to the task. That fear is a good fear, a fear that says I am not equal to the task. Therefore, I trust in you, O Lord. Therefore, Lord. I pray for the you raising up the people who you already have in mind who will make this possible because we know it's God-pleasing. We know it honors you. We know it will bless this community. It will be a witness to kids. It's going to do tremendous things. It's going to do a godly thing. So I know it's going to do that. But man, if it's up to me, I'm terrified. I am not equal to the test, and none of us are. Not a one of us are. But God is. So there is some fear that should lead us there. But the other fear that leads us to paralyzation actually is very selfish, isn't it? The other fear that says, we can't do this because if I can't do it, then it can't be done. Like, I remember taking my kids to amusement parks. And, you know, I don't know, your kids ever scared of roller coasters when they were little? And so my kids would go, no, I'm not going on that. I'm not going. Dad, I'm not going on that. I'm not doing it. Look, it goes upside down. There's people are throwing up. I'm not doing that. And I go... <laughs> And I go, yeah, come on. Well, but look, it looks really dangerous. And I go, here's my, here's my line. Nobody dies in the roller coaster. Okay, we'll strap you in. We'll go. And even if you throw up, it's all good. You'll still be alive. Right? So that's, and that's how I convince myself, actually, to go on the roller coaster. I'm sitting there going, nobody dies on these. Nobody dies on these. The really bad thing is when you read the Internet like the next day and find out three people have, that's not good. Not good. Yeah, so, but that's the fear, and so, and here's my point on that. In this journey, a little bit of fear causes me to trust God. A little bit of fear is me saying, so, you know what I mean? So the person who goes to you and says, oh, you're going through treatment? Oh, you shouldn't be afraid because you're, well, that's baloney. Of course there's, of course. Or, you know, I'm getting married. Uh, you know, it should all be perfect, right? No fear. Well, I get it. Little bit, little bit makes us trust God. Too much fear makes us selfish. Fourth point, we're lost, right? And here's the thing about getting lost. You know what happens when you get lost? Everybody starts blaming the other person. Isn't that what happens? What'd you do? You can't, what, don't you know how to use that thing? Sorry, honey. I should never say that to you. Anyway, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going, 
You know, don't you have it plugged in right? Did you put in the right address? What's going on? How come we're lost? We made a wrong turn. And there are some turns which are really bad, some which are slight diversions. And, you know, it's different today. So those of you that are kids, you know, that are 20 years old and younger, you don't know what it means to have to read a map, okay? Or, you know, really rely on it to get where you need to get to go. And, and then, you know, there used to be things like construction and road construction and detours and stuff like that that you had no idea where you were. And so there are times when we're lost, and the problem is it's often a time to point fingers. Let me tell you a story. So my nephew, Jason... He and I used to spend a fair amount of time together, my, my brother Steve and his kids. So Jason was in middle school or early in high school, and we took a trip out to Glacier. And I said to my, you know, I was, I don't know, I was in university or grad school or something. I had some time. And I said, hey, Jason, come out with me. I'm going to visit a buddy in Kalispell. We'll run up to Glacier. We'll fish a little bit. We'll camp a little bit, and we'll come on back. So we had a window of time. Boom, off we go. And I'm driving back, and I remember very distinctly and we had done this throughout the trip. We had just kind of, I'd see a road sign, you know, like world's largest ball of twine, you know, that kind of thing. Or there's a roadside thing that says world's best taco, and we would see if it was, you know, that kind of thing. It never was. But anyway, we would divert. And one time we're down at the gorge, down at Vantage, and there's Ginkgo State National Park or whatever, and it's like fossils and stuff. I, hey, I said, hey, we were heading home. We were supposed to be home in a few hours. I said, hey, let's pull up, you know, and I go in there. At the end of that, we get back in the car, and my nephew says to me, he was very mature, he said to me, Uncle Jonathan, thanks for doing that. And I said, what do you mean? He says, when, he says in all the trips that we made, we never took a side trip, you know, my mom, with mom and dad. It was always here and there. The sad thing is I've become like that. Now I'm like the guy who says, when I leave here, I t- say to my family, okay, we're going to get in Boise at 3.52 in the afternoon. And then I do everything on my power to make sure that it says 3.52 when I come in. That's a little sick. That's a little sad. Because um, if I'm five minutes late, I'm very disappointed. God forbid I should be 30 minutes wrong. You know, my world is over. But on that one, my nephew said to me, thanks for diverting. He says, because you know what? With my parents, any time they took a side road off, it was because they made a mistake. And we spent the next hour, they spent the next hour arguing about who was wrong. And he said, one of the times we took a, de- we took a wrong turn and we were off, off the road for an hour and my parents were arguing the whole time and my sister and I were in the back and it was the most beautiful part of the trip we had ever seen. And they missed it. And so this is the point. Sometimes when we have a wrong turn, I'm guaranteeing you this, there are times God puts us on that wrong turn. I believe it because there are times on that wrong turn because they make some wrong turns here, but God still hangs in there with them. And through those turns and through the journey of getting back, if the journey never had any wrong turns, how would you know to turn to God to put you back on the right track? And so God is calling us back to the right track even when we make wrong turns. Last point, if those kids don't stop, I'm kicking you out, right? So I've heard this one in a grocery store line where a mom was so put off by her tantrum kids, her kids were in such a tantrum and squealing and screaming and whining and this and that, till she finally said, if you guys don't stop, we're not going to go to Disneyland this week. Well, you know she's lying, right? See, they're going. The trip's paid for, all right? I mean, they're going. So you can't use that threat. But boy, we'd like to, wouldn't we? (laughs) There are times we'd love to say, if you guys don't knock it off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you behind. In fact, I might pick up some new kids, okay? Better ones, all right? But we don't do that, do we? We don't do that. And this is the good news, the last thing I want you to hear from this. Boy, do we deserve at times to be kicked out of the back seat and left by the side of the road, and God never does it. If we don't do it, God is so good. He never kicks us out of it. Now, are there times we, th- we need some discipline, some correction, and so forth? But thanks be to God, he never kicks us out and leaves us by the side of the road. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, in journeys like this, there are hard ones, there are difficult ones and challenging ones, but there are joys in the journey. Even in the midst of the challenges that we have, sometimes we're fearful, Lord, sometimes we've never been there before, sometimes we don't know if we'll have the money, the patience, the time, to endure the journey, sometimes we take wrong turns. 
Lord, it is so easy to be ungrateful and to be grumblers. But rather, Lord, in the journey, you are longing for us to rely on you, that you have been there, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, and that even in our wrong turns, you will guide us back to yourself. And so, Lord, continue to lead us faithfully and gratefully through the journey which we are, having, which we are making with you. To the praise and honor of your name, amen.